Thank you for coming to the policy briefing farewell to fluorescence, how states can lead the way. It is 2.01 p.m. Eastern time where I am, so um, I'd like to go ahead and kick off today's policy briefing. Um, first of all, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Johanna Newman, and I am the Senior Director of Environment America's Campaign for 100% Renewable Energy. And I am delighted to emcee today's policy briefing about farewell to fluorescence, how states can lead the way. Environment America is one of the sponsoring organizations of today's event, along with PERG and the Appliance Standards Awareness Project. I do wanna make sure before we get started that everyone knows that this is a public event. Um, it is being recorded and members of the media or the public may be in attendance. Although the briefing is specifically geared towards state lawmakers and legislative staff. So with that, I would like to go ahead and walk through our agenda for today and introduce our speakers. After my opening remarks, we'll hear the detailed policy briefing from Brian Fady, the State Policy Associate with the Appliance Standards Awareness Project. And while many organizations and businesses have come out in support of this policy, I'm particularly excited that Charles Helget, the California Director of Government Affairs for Republic Waste Services is able to join us today to share why his um, company supports this policy. Um, and then uh, we'll walk through some resources and go into Q&A. So that's our plan. Before we hear from Brian, I do just want to thank and acknowledge the legislative leaders who are carrying this policy forward at the state level this legislative session, including Representative Kathy Kim from Colorado and Representative Nicole Lowen from Hawaii, Nick Smith from Illinois is the representative leading the charge there and representative Art Bell in Maine. In Massachusetts, representative Josh Cutler has teamed up with Senator Susan Moran to introduce clean lighting policy. In Maryland, delegate Jen Teresa is leading the charge and in Rhode Island, longtime environmental champion Art Handy is championing this bill. In New Mexico, representative Christina Ortez is leading the charge in Nevada, Assemblywoman Selena LaRue Hatch is championing the bill. And tomorrow, Representative Pam Marsh in Oregon will actually be speaking about the benefits of this policy at that bill hearing. And hopefully Representative David Hackney is reflecting positively on the bill hearing that happened in Washington state yesterday. So there's a lot of momentum around the country and none of this would be possible without the leadership on the part of lawmakers like you. Um, your contribution truly has the potential to reduce energy waste, lower electric bills, and reduce toxic pollution, and we're very grateful for your efforts. All right, with that, I'm excited to introduce Brian Fady. Brian is the State Policy Associate with the Appliance Standards Awareness Project, or ASAP. ASAP is housed at the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, or ACEEE, and organizes and leads a broad-based coalition effort that works to advance, win, and defend new appliance, equipment, and lighting standards. Environment America and ASAP have worked together on appliance standards for a long time um, and thrilled to continue partnering on this effort. With that, Brian, take it away. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Johanna. Um, hi, everybody. Again, Brian Fady with ASAP, and I'm here to do an overview of the clean lighting policy. And this is all about reducing mercury pollution while saving money. And next slide, please. So some quick background. What is clean lighting? Uh, what we're talking about here are fluorescent light bulbs and that fluorescent light bulbs are still seeing uh, significant sales around the country. And importantly, they contain mercury by design. It's just part of how a fluorescent light bulb works. There's a little bit of mercury put inside the bulb, and that becomes uh, key to this whole effort. Um, and what we're talking about here, you know, you think of fluorescent light bulbs, we've got a couple of pictures on the right. Um, really, the biggest sales volumes that we're still seeing are, are the top picture there, what's called the linear fluorescent light bulbs. These are, you know, usually four feet in length, but they can be other sizes. And they're found, you know, you see them in the ceilings of most any office building or a school or sort of anywhere with a large indoor space. You see these uh, linear fluorescents. 
Uh, but we're also uh, talking about the picture on the bottom there, our old friend, the compact fluorescence, the CFLs, uh, which have uh, declined in sales quite a bit, but still are seeing a good chunk of sales um, and also contain uh, mercury. So the goal here is to phase out the sales of uh, these common fluorescent light bulbs in favor of LEDs, uh, light emitting diodes. Uh, LEDs are twice as energy efficient as the fluorescents. They last two to three times longer and they don't contain mercury. And this means that uh, large savings can be generated on energy, on air pollution emissions like carbon dioxide, uh, utility bill savings can be generated, and mercury pollution can be avoided uh, by switching to the LEDs. And next slide. So last year, uh, my organization and ACEEE, uh, we put out a new report. We surveyed the lighting market, uh, seeking to answer the question, are LEDs ready to go to replace the fluorescents? And you know, we looked across a uh, couple of key criteria. What's the availability of replacement LEDs? Uh, what's their performance ability compared to uh, fluorescents? Uh, what's the life cycle costs of the LEDs versus fluorescents? And then we did a state-by-state -state savings analysis of you know, what sort of savings could each state see by switching to LEDs. And uh, the long story short, all of these came back positive. Uh, LEDs are now widely available and cost effective across the different sizes and shapes. They perform the same or better as the fluorescents they're looking to replace. And they would indeed generate uh, quite a bit of savings. And we'll touch on that in a second here. Um, next slide. This is kind of a, a don't take our word for it slide. Um, you know, a lot of the big name companies that make the fluorescents also make the LEDs, and they do a good job of selling their products. And, uh, you know, here we've got some advertising from Philips talking about real pros say farewell to fluorescents and advertising one of their products as being the ideal alternative to standard fluorescent tubes for all demanding lighting applications. And uh, certainly other companies, we've got you know statements and marketing material from other companies as well in the in that 2022 report, um, which folks can feel free to check out. Next slide. So I mentioned uh, we did state by state savings analysis at the top here. I just pulled one as an example. Um, this is from Michigan. We can jump forward one slide here. What we did was, uh, you know, we looked at shipments of fluorescent lamps or light bulbs uh, to the states and calculated what sort of savings could states see uh, by switching to the LEDs. And so looking at the table on the top here, uh, these are, you know, we did them on different time horizons, annual savings in the year 2030. Uh, we can have it for cumulative savings in the year 2050. But, uh, you know, we've got mercury, from the lamps being shipped, you know, savings there, uh, any sort of power plant mercury emission reductions. And this is mainly coal plants running less. Um, we've also got CO2 emissions that would be avoided by switching to the LEDs, uh, potential annual electricity savings that a state would see. And on the right there of the, uh, the top table is the big one, um, potential annual electricity bill savings that a state could see. So these are statewide numbers. The example pulled here, you know, the state of Michigan could see $149 million in utility bill savings in the year 2030 uh, annually by making the switch here. And so we have these for every state. Um, and Johanna will uh, mention later the, the website where you can find them. Uh, then at the bottom here, uh, we also did light bulb economics. Just pulled one example. Uh, this is by far the most common, um, uh, most uh, highest sales volume product is the four foot T8. And you know, we took a look at if the LED costs more, how much more does it cost? Here it was at fifty four cents. Um, then we looked at you know how much money would you save on electricity bills in your first year from using the LED compared to the fluorescent. Then we looked at what's the life cycle 
uh, savings of the LED. How much do you save with that LED bulb over its life? And then we looked at on the right here, a lot of folks look for is uh, the payback period. You know, how long does it take to recover that increase in purchase price with the alternative product? Uh, this one, four foot T8 LEDs are, are very cost competitive. You're seeing a payback period of just a month or two, really, um, which is a fantastic payback period um, across sort of the appliance standards landscape. And we have this for other sizes and shapes as well. Next slide. We mentioned mercury. Uh, yes, mercury content is the phase out approach here. It's really the policy approach. Um, and states around the country have uh, for decades now had laws on the books regulating mercury products. We've got a map here. If the state is in green, it has at least some kind of mercury product regulation. Uh, popular uh, when these first were coming out was sort of ending the sales of uh, thermostats, mercury thermostats, or mercury thermometers, but a, a number of states went further and, you know, even regulated fluorescent light bulbs at the time, putting on labeling requirements, putting on recycling requirements or disposal requirements. Um, and so states vary by, you know, how much sort of comprehensive of the existing mercury policies. But, you know, if you see your state in green, you've got uh, something to build on. It's a precedent. It's uh, legislatures having decided that mercury is a toxic substance that we, you know, like to uh, regulate, and you can really see the the clean lighting policy as an extension of that. Uh, and if your state doesn't have you know existing mercury policies, you can certainly uh, look to that other states have done this. It, it's a very common policy around the country. And next slide. So yeah, last year, 2022, um, a couple of states ran uh, clean lighting legislation and uh, it passed in uh, Vermont and California. And a note, um, you know, put under the California there, some of the folks who supported the bill. Um, first, uh, the industry folks, you know, fluorescent lighting manufacturers represented by NEMA, the National Electrical Manufacturers Association, they actually dropped their opposition to the bill. Um, in particular, I think they wanted an additional year on the sales phase out. I think the bill was introduced as 2024 being the sales phase out, and we landed on 2025. Um, and with that, uh, NEMA pulled its opposition from the bill, which was really great to see. And then, uh, you know, so support included a couple of labor organizations, SEIU California, as well as the California Teamsters. Uh, and I think both of these relate to workers who uh, face mercury exposure from the fluorescent light bulbs, from handling the fluorescent light bulbs at, at somewhere in their life cycle, whether it's custodial workers in buildings, uh, whether it's workers in the waste stream. Uh, trash collection, recycling collection, landfills, recycling facilities, uh, you know, anybody who's handling or around these fluorescents, uh, there's a mercury vapor inside the bulb. And if those things break and they break, uh, it releases a gas that is a pretty uh, nasty health hazard for anybody who's around that. Um, and so, you know, the labor unions representing those workers, I think, saw it as a way to reduce their workers' um, exposure to that risk. And then at the bottom there, um, find folks for, for public services and waste management. You know, two of the largest waste companies in the country um, supported the bill as well. And uh, certainly Chuck to, can speak to that in a moment here. But there were other organizations that supported. I think the final list, we had about 80 entities that signed on to a, a letter to the governor asking that they sign the bill. It included municipal waste facilities, conservation organizations, uh, groups focused on reducing hazardous waste in our communities, sort of the, the zero waste uh, movement. So it was a really broad uh, you know, network and coalition of, of support, uh, you know, not just sort of traditional kind of climate environmental groups, but uh, quite a few more of different backgrounds, which was really great to see. 
And I think that's it. I will turn it back over to Johanna. Excellent. Thanks so much. Um, I really just appreciate you bringing your expertise to this group, Brian. Appreciate it. So um, if folks have questions, we encourage you to use the Q&A function of the Zoom platform. Um, so just type your question in there and um, we'll get to it at the end of today's presentation. So with that, I would like to introduce Charles Helget, who is currently the California Director of Government Affairs for Republic Services. He has represented Republic Services Inc. and their various predecessor companies for more than 20 years. He's been actively engaged in waste sector policy development and implementation at the local, state, um, legislative, and state regulatory levels. So with that, Chuck. Thank you, Johanna, and thank you, Brian, um, and welcome, everyone. While disposal um, has been of, of fluorescent lamps has been banned in California, um, we still see lamps um, in our waste and disposal stream. Um, and last year, we chose to um, add our support to the passage of AB 2208, a bill authored by Assemblymember Kalra. Uh, and we saw it as an opportunity to further reduce the environmental worker safety and cost impacts, um, environmental um, worker safety and cost impacts uh, that are caused um, by these lamps in our waste stream and disposal and uh, recycling stream. No municipal solid waste company wants hazardous mercury, um, in, 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 which is contained in, in fragile glass, to end up in our, um, our waste stream or in our recycling stream. Um, from a disposal perspective, we are obligated to keep the mercury out of our landfills and out of our leachate and groundwater for obvious reasons that were covered very well by Brian. Um, from a material recovery perspective, mercury and glass, in our view, poses a, a significant threat to our worker safety. Um, from mercury exposure um, and from glass cuts um, that, that occur when we're, we're processing this material at our material recovery facilities, at our transfer stations, and at our, and at our landfills. When these lamps particularly are improperly um, placed into our garbage or recycling bins, uh, many times inadvertently, sometimes unfortunately, um, simply without thinking, uh, these bulbs um, manage their way into our waste stream. Um, they, they then add contamination to the, particularly to our recycling stream um, and, and increase recycling costs associated um, with ensuring that these lamps are not placed in, in the solid waste stream or in our disposal bins. Um, we have to continuously um, update and, and distribute um, informational um, material to our customers, not just our commercial, but our residential customers to make sure that they're aware that these bulbs are not to be placed in the waste stream. Um, and at the same time, um, we have been a, a very aggressive um, nationally in, in putting together programs um, for separate collection of these materials, recognizing that there are um, uh, recyclable opportunities for these um, uh, bulbs if in fact they're handled and managed correctly. Um, with that, <clears throat> again, I just want to reiterate that we are very, uh, very concerned about um, the impact of these bulbs that not only they have on our um, on, on our disposal and our landfills, but also on the recycling systems that we have to operate um, nationally. Uh, so with that, Joanna, back to you. Um, happy to stay on and answer any questions. Great, thank you so much. Um, all right, next, I would just like to share some of the resources available on this campaign. So there are numerous studies that have been done on this issue. And if you are interested in the savings for your state with regard to energy usage or mercury averted or carbon dioxide emissions reduced, um, the ASAP is your go-to place for that. Um, and the link at the top of this slide um, will take you directly to the resources that they've compiled in terms of state savings. Also available at that link is model legislation in case there's a lawmaker who is interested in um, introducing this bill in states beyond the ones where the bill is already introduced. 
Um, ASAP also offers the market analysis on the availability of the, um, excuse me, LED bulbs um, and their viability for replacing uh, the CFLs. And then um, at that link, there's a report on the human health impacts of fluorescent lighting done by CLASP. Um, the two additional resources at the bottom um, are from Environment America and PERG, and they offer opportunities um, both to just get a primer on what the policy is about and why the public should care, as well as offers constituents engagement opportunities. Um, if you would like to be in touch uh, with anyone or have additional questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, Brian Fady and his colleague Josh McClenney's email is on the slide, as is mine and the PERG Environment Campaign's director, Matt Cassell. Uh, but given that Environment America and PERG are federations of state-based groups, first and foremost, you likely may have gotten an invitation from your in-state PERG or environment advocate. Those should be your first point of contact. Um, all right, and with that, um, that ends the formal presentation portion of today's webinar.